This episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlock Holmes scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the beaches were copper, the pince was golden, and the blaze was silver, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutiae? Have you ever stopped to wonder about the difference between Holmes's pipes? Or how often he smoked cigars versus cigarettes? Or what Egyptian cigarettes are like? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Walder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 267, On the Scent with Sherlock Holmes, Part 2. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, have you have you got your I I don't even know. I do, do you wear a special pair of of snifters when we're when we're um doing these these episodes or what what's your what's your mode? I have a hand carved Victorian clothespin that I apply to my nose. <laughs> So that I can concentrate fully on what I'm saying and not be distracted by any strange aromas. Well, I'm I'm very glad to hear that, and I'm I'm going to try to do the same myself. It's a good thing we're not co-located, so we don't have to experience each other's uh, aroma, shall we say? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> this episode can be found at ihose.co slash trifles two six seven. All lowercase, that'll take you directly to the SherlockHolmesPodcast.com website where you can find all kinds of, oh, background information, links to some of the things we're talking about, as well as our social media profiles, our email address, which is trifles that I hear of Sherlock.com, and a call-in line if you would like to dial us up and leave a message, or you can simply record an MP3 on your phone and email it to us, whatever way it works. But our phone number is 5-1895-221-B-5. Take that down, 5-1895-221-B-5. You can leave a message on the IHOS Media voicemail there, and we'd be delighted to hear from you. Well, if you were around here a few episodes ago, I believe it was episode 263 last month, we talked about On the Scent with Sherlock Holmes, a, a book that we have each found. I, I don't remember exactly how we came across this particular volume. It is uh, from Gaslight Publications, copyright 1987, uh, On the Scent with Sherlock Holmes by Walter Shepherd, mm. uh, do you do you remember how we came across this particular volume, Burn? I think it may have come from Dan Poznanski, wasn't it? Didn't it be you know, part of that? You know what? I think you're right. I think it came from the auction of uh, Dan Poznanski's things, and either there was one copy in there or two. And if there was one, we may have scurried off to ABE Books and picked up another copy. So we each had a had one at our elbow. And by the way, uh, if you're looking for some of these titles that we're covering in this season, uh, you know, we're, we're referring to old bits of scholarship just to kind of bring out some of the minutia in the Sherlock Holmes stories. They are typically available on uh, ABE books or other places. We try to provide links. Of course, the, the BSI Press has some of these as well. So if you want to go ahead and track these down yourself, we do provide links to these as occasion allows. Now, the last time we were here, Bert, we talked about some of the, the varying scents that some of uh, our, our confreres in the canon would have come across. In particular, we talked about 
Oh, things that Sherlock Holmes was getting his nose into and uh, a study in Scarlet and the cardboard box and uh, the sign of four in particular. I think we talked about creosote as part of that. And we thought we would continue the conversation here following Walter Shepard's lead in some of the other smells that one might come across living in Victorian London. So where does that leave us? It's a great subject. It leaves us with a lot to talk about. And again, to remind our listeners who picked this up probably in episode 263, hopefully, the uh, first part, Walter Shepard was writing this from the standpoint of someone who is a very young man who was really in and of this environment because his book goes back, I think, to the 19... It was published in the 1980s, but I think it goes back longer than that, certainly to the 1970s. And it was an area, Shepard tells us, that um, a sense of smell was very important to, to have in, the, in this part of the late 19th century. Because, he says, London's inhabitants were then assailed daily by a far greater variety of scents, odors, and plain stinks than the modern Londoner can readily imagine. It was impossible in those days to go anywhere in the streets without smelling something even if it were only a pile of steaming horse manure, which, he says, by the way, was not thought to be at all unpleasant. And, of course, when you get into this, you realize that um, it was just part of the fabric of everyday life because the energy by which you moved carts and people around this great growing metropolis was the energy of horses, And according to uh, sources that Shepard quotes, each horse dropped on the average of 42 pounds of fresh manure on the streets every two hours. And he says horses were the chief source of power for the transport of all kinds other than the railways. There were about 20,000 horses employed by bus and tram companies. And you can't even estimate. How many were used by tradesmen or carriers or cabs or private carriages? And the army had several large stables. And still more horses came into London from the country daily, bringing the meat and vegetables and fruit and other products to the market. So so if if uh, Walter Shepard's sources are right, and there's no reason to doubt that they weren't, there were at least a 1,000 tons of manure to be collected from the streets of London every day. I'm I'm at a loss here. I mean, <laughs> okay, so you're surrounded by it every day. That doesn't necessarily mean it's inoffensive. I mean, I'm I sit behind diesel trucks in traffic, and trucks are hauling uh, vegetables, produce, all kinds of supplies in and out of cities and everywhere. I don't like particularly like the smell of diesel fumes. <laughs> just because I'm around them. Um, so I think there's a, there's a difference here between, um, you know, what, we're, uh, what, what we will tolerate versus what is actually inoffensive. And furthermore, I'm given to understand, and, and I can't remember exactly where I came across this, but it was in recent history. Someone informed me that one horse actually has 15 horsepower. (laughs) Now, I don't know who did the calculations. Clearly, it wasn't Professor Moriarty and his treatise on the asteroid theory. But um, if that's the case, if you have a team of horses hauling around some of these large uh, vehicles, um, you're getting more than two, three, four horsepower. (laughs) Well, that's wonderful. I never thought of that calculation. But, you know, the problem is that we're looking at this from a 21st, from a 20th century, 21st century perspective. I mean, England in the 1890s, you know, was still, well, and still is today very much an agrarian community, obviously outside of the big cities. And so if you grew up in the country and there was much more country in the 1890s than there is today, Around the farm, around horses on the farm, around the fields, around the sheep, around the cows. You know, this is just part of the sense, the aroma, 
the streets, you know, the, the tar covered streets, you know, were rare if, if they existed at all in those days. And it was just part of the fabric of, of living, living closer to the land. Yeah. Yeah. And I would imagine, and, and I know we're going to get into some more of the earthy things, but, but before we do that, one of the other uh, realities of life back then is uh, there wasn't deodorant. You know, the humans were human smelling. And uh, again, you, it was something you had to live with, uh, you know, I, and I'm sure, you know, through the uh, creation of certain apothecaries, perfumes, soaps, etc., that was addressed, but uh, they didn't have the regular antiperspirants and deodorants that we have today. Uh, maybe a little talcum powder here and there, maybe a little perfume. The, the scented handkerchief was a, a weapon of choice for many gentlemen in the city for years. <laughs> well, too true. And, you know, one of the things you'll see in the cases of Sherlock Holmes and then in the recreations of Victorian adventures on the screen and on, uh, in other forms is occasionally you'll see people going off for trips. They'll get on the train mm. and they'll have a very small bag with them. And one of the reasons why... They could they could make do with very little to carry around is that if you had a shirt, as an example, as a gent, you know, as you know, you would probably typically be wearing the same shirt for five days or mm -hmm. more. But you'd be changing the collar and you'd be changing maybe the cuffs, you know, and, um, you know, that. Um, yeah, that is not not up to. Uh, 21st century standards of laundry by any means. It, it, it was not. It was not. Um, but you know what? Uh, it, it, I'm also reminded, um, speaking of, uh, you know, personal fastidiousness and, and sense and whatnot, in the Three Gables, you'll remember this, in the Three Gables, uh, when Holmes was being uh, threatened by Steve Dixie that, uh, in that boisterous ent entrance in Baker Street, um, he said, looking for your gun, Master Holmes? And he said, no, for my scent bottle, Steve. <laughs> As if to say, you smell, get out of my face. Ah, oh, that's true. I've forgotten that. Yeah. Oh, it's another great example of aromas popping up in the Sherlock Holmes stories. Yeah. The, other th the other thing that Shepard mentions here, and we'll just skip over this a little bit, is the Street Finders, you know, a community of largely kids, maybe some Baker Street Irregulars. The activities, he says, of bone grubbers, rag gatherers, cigar end collectors, and many others. Perhaps the Baker Street Irregulars were recruited from them. And perhaps from the boys known as Pure Finders. And they collected dog dung. <laughs> from the pavements and curbstones, which they would sell to the tanners of Bermondsey at a shilling a pailful. Well, that's interesting. And this perhaps makes us understand why, aside from the ruckus that the Baker Street Irregulars caused in the sitting room and, and within 221B, perhaps that kind of, well, shall we say, sanitary condition, unsanitary condition of the boys is what caused Holmes to instruct Wiggins to be the only one to come in and leave the other boys out in the street. Oh, right, right. Well, Walter, Walter Shepard zips past that happily and gets us to some of the more pleasant sense of the period that we no longer experience. Um, he says, for example, on a hot summer's day after a heavy shower, as soon as the sun beat down again on the wet, grit roads, a quite indescribable odor accompanied the steam which rose from them. And this scent may still be enjoyed in areas where the grit roads survive and in regions of barren, dusty, or clayey earth without soil, you know, maybe in Australia or in the Indian state, he says, of Uttar Pradesh. He's, he says it's recently been the subject of scientific research, and the scent is attributed to the microscopic traces of an oily or resinous substance by particles of a clay-like nature in the dust or grit, and it originates, apparently, from plants of many kinds, the volatile essences of which are evaporated by hot sunshine and carried by breezes to the barren areas. The name petrichor has been given to it in Australia, 
though its nature is not precisely known. Holmes and Watson were perfectly familiar with this peculiar road scent, and there may have been occasions upon which it served to tell Holmes what street he was in, though Watson does not mention it. Hmm. Yeah, and he says our, our more modern road surfaces are entirely free of it, or it was never present in central London or in densely built up areas. Asphalt uh, began to be used, of course, in 1871, but though the smells of asphalt and hot tar are still with us, and I'm, I'm sure anyone who's experienced a, uh, a hot summer rain near a road can understand uh, what that smells like. Uh, they've been much less common or pungent since emulsions have been used for waterproofing roads. So an interesting uh, change in the chemistry of road tops that has led to different scents over the ages. Well, let's continue this discussion right after this quick word from our sponsor. <laughs> The Baker Street Journal was first published in 1946, and its old series extended through 1949. It picked up again in 1951 and has been publishing ceaselessly every quarter since then. Every issue of the BSJ is packed with top-notch papers, papers that reflect the sensibilities of Sherlockians from throughout the world. They might be scholarly in nature, giving us details on an aspect of Victorian life that maybe we weren't aware of. They might be tongue-in-cheek, that approach to the game where we wink at each other as we acknowledge Dr. Watson as the true author of the stories and try to figure out some inconsistency. Or they might be something that we never thought was related to Sherlock Holmes, and the author brings it all together for us. Whatever the approach, they're all represented in the Baker Street Journal. Plenty of varying opinions and researches on the world of Sherlock Holmes. Make sure you get on the subscription list to get your copy of the Baker Street Journal delivered to your mailbox every quarter by going to BakerStreetIrregulars.com today. All right, we're back. And what is that smell? Well, <laughs> what? <laughs> Walter Shepard uh, quickly takes us past some of these geological scents. And he does, by the way, point out things. I'm sure some of our listeners have remembered the first chapter of The Sign of Four, where Holmes deduces Watson's been to the Wigmore Street post office from a little reddish mold adhering to your instep. Um, you know, this I, think, peculiar I think thing. Holmes knew the horse that hung out in front of the Wigmore Street Post Office, and Watson brought traces of that with him. <laughs> ah, old Dobbin Watson, yes. Uh, but we get into the mechanical transport sense, which are really interesting. And in the year of the Boscombe Valley mystery, which Shepard attributes to 1890, he says, that was the year the first electrically driven underground railway was opened. It was called the City and South London Railway, and it ran through an iron tube passing under the Thames for the width of the river. And then he says in the year of the Dancing Man, 1898, the Waterloo and City Railway opened the second line. But it offered a rather different kind of musty smell, readily distinguished from the other. Uh, both lines were well below the bread of the river. But uh, Holmes and Watson would have certainly been familiar with their distinctive odors. And then the next underground line opened in 1900, the year, says Shepherd of the Priory School and the Six Napoleons, the central line running under Oxford Street and Holborn to the city. This was popularly known as the Tuppany Tube, but the earliest of uh, all the so-called underground railways were in no sense tubes, but they were cut and cover lines. They ran along deep cuttings, frequently bridged over and I found very interesting, you know, the trains were driven by steam so that traveling on them was a somewhat smoky experience. But I didn't realize this. Shepard says the old underground trains were steam driven, but the railway had long since stopped using locomotives, which emitted either steam or smoke because it interfered with the signaling. The engines were fitted with smoke traps and steam condensers, which he says you can see in many of the photographs 
by the large pipes that lay along their sides from the cylinders and the firebox. Though the smell of smoke was often noticeable, it was evidently regarded as less objectionable than tobacco smoke. He says tobacco smoking had been forbidden entirely on the Metropolitan Line until 1874. Really? The yeah, but the popular idea of the extreme smokiness of the old underground, he says, uh, is attributed to the fogs. You know, when London was blanketed with a pea soup fog, the underground tunnels were also full of it. And at such times, it was often impossible to see more than a few inches in front of your nose. And the underground remained full of the apparent smoke long after the upper Air had cleared. Wow. Well, that makes sense. I mean, usually the fog was denser than air, uh, and and certainly much of the those those greasy yellow fogs that we hear about they were uh, coal derivatives, basically. You know, you had the coal soot in the air combining with the moisture, and uh, they created essentially what we know today as smog, and that would settle uh, underground in in uh, the tube stations. So that that makes great sense, and. Um, you know, you can only imagine uh, the mess it would have created with steam-driven trains creating more moisture in that kind of a scenario. I mean, it's no wonder they moved to pneumatic tubes uh, as the uh, the underground. You know, it pushed from uh, like a, like a vacuum pack seal uh, from one station to, to the other. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't keep a straight face. <laughs> Well, it's much better than the original plan, which was to have horse-drawn carriages underground, because then you would have been stifled by all of that uh, consumed fuel, shall we say. Yes, yes. Well, you know, once the 1011 left the station, there'd be shoveling. So <laughs> I, would throw the, I would throw the schedule right off. But Shepard, Shepherd, speaking of a mess, you know, Shepard says, there was often the smell of ordinary smoke in, in the London air, especially in winter. For then all kinds of coal were being burnt in a million fireplaces and a thousand factory furnaces and maybe a thousand railway engines. And that doesn't even count the steamers on the river. There was no official smoke control above ground and the coal being burnt produced the soot, which blackened the white Portland stone of London's churches and government offices mm. and great commercial buildings. It attacked the magnesian limestone of which the new houses of parliament were built, turning it slowly into Epsom salts, which the rain washed away. Oh, they must houses have made for some great baths in that area. <laughs> <laughs> when Holmes and Watson lived in Baker Street, they were but two of some four million Londoners who all relied on coal fires for cooking, hot baths, laundering, and winter warmth. And the pall of smoke grew year by year through the wider use of coke and other smokeless fuels, though the wider use of coke and other smokeless fuels was encouraged and gas fires and cookers were finding a growing market. But electric heating had scarcely been heard of in Holmes's time, hmm. except as a curiosity. Indeed. And it was not until 1956 that the first Clean Air Act was passed by Parliament. And as a result, the emission of smoke was forbidden from any chimney in some 3,000 smoke control areas. F absolutely fascinating. By 1958, there was an 80% reduction of smoke pollution in London and a 70% increase in the December sunshine. Well, that's because Sherlock Holmes had moved down to Sussex by that point. <laughs> and that is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. How is it, Watson? It is disgusting, Holmes. <laughs>